Hola and welcome to a new episode of the Ruthless um, Dog and Pony Show. <laughs> My name is Julio Panicello and I am the dream alchemist at Ruthless Painters, a free range art school and gallery for creative nomads. Each episode of the show uh, features the theme of our next painting collection so you can learn what we will be painting this week. And all right yes um we're having some technical difficulties but i hope it's gonna be okay um in addition to uh discussing the origin of the concepts theme and its contemporary context we explore the possibilities for visual representation on our work uh, using paintings throughout uh history as inspiration we cite stylistic and historical references in many ways, our episodes are like our paintings, messy and predictable and unvarnished. Hi, everyone. All episodes can be found as video on Instagram and on our YouTube channel and as podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Amazon Music and everywhere. Essentially, you just type uh, the Ruthless Dog and Pony Show anywhere that plays a podcast and you can uh, find a lot of our episodes. You're invited to um, contact us um, with any questions or remarks or corrections. Um, and also, if you'd like to contribute uh, with your notes to the presentation. And we're going to go right ahead. So uh, this week... This weekend in particular um, is a big weekend because it's Memorial Day and um, it's an important uh, day, obviously. But um, for us, the most important thing is that it's going to be the beginning of the summer. So we talked and we reflected about how this year, after um, what we have gone through uh, collectively, how is this going to feel? Because it seems like this is going to be the actual beginning of a normal summer. Although, uh, you know, some people have reservations about exactly when that's going to happen. But um, certainly we're not the same way right now as we were in 2020. And uh, definitely summer of uh, 2019, which now looks like really like a long time ago. So because we're going to have this new opportunity, we wanted to reflect of what's going to happen. What's, what is it going to look like? Uh, how are we going to feel about it? And uh, in talking about subjects that may be uh, represent, representative of summer, obviously we end up going back to the figure of the bather. Because uh, bathers uh, have been um, really um, predominant uh, in paintings throughout we would say the end of the 18th century and throughout the 20th century. So we associate uh, summer with going to the beach or going to the pool, but um, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. And in this presentation, we're going to show you examples of paintings throughout uh, modern history, we would say, um, of bathers. And at the same time, we'll just give um, a couple of uh, perspectives about why symbolically this could be a good example or a good subject to paint. One talking or one side or one perspective talking about why it's amazing to be uh, at the beach and another one it's gonna be why it may not happen at all this year for so many things that um, have been accumulating in the past like few months. Um, so we'll see. But in the meantime, we're just going to dedicate this week's um, uh, attention, focus, uh, workshops, time, painting time to painting uh, bathers. Um, and this could be in the form of uh, personal photographs that we may have uh, of ourselves or our family going to the beach uh, because the history of sunbathing or bathing or going at the beach has changed dramatically throughout the last uh, few years. And also it's a very recent history. People didn't see the beach as a place to enjoy ourselves um, 
until the end of the or mid um, 19th century, actually. Uh, so it's an it's a modern invention and the usage of the beach uh, or the pool has changed dramatically and more so in the last few months, as uh, we were just saying. So this originated. Let me just kind of like bring one example first, one painting. This is a painting by David Park, who was a um, painter, one of the most famous painters of the Bay Area figurative movement. We talked about or uh, we were in a conversation about him like recently, a few weeks ago. And he is mostly known for paintings that he did in a very um, uh, neo-expressionist way of bathers. And by the way, we curated a selection of paintings that um, stretched from the end of the 19th century uh, to uh, recently in a way that moves completely away from we hope from the the male gaze. There were a lot of painters, especially at the turn of the century, nineteenth to twentieth, that took the opportunity to uh, the opportunity of painting bathers to just paint a bunch of naked ladies, and there was a lot of um, objectification of the female body at the time. We're not gonna show any of that, and there are plenty of Renoirs and plenty of other. Um, uh, examples uh, of that um, but uh, yeah w w we're going to show you this one first um, this example of an interesting composition of figures this will be a figure based assignment it's a figure based assignment coming out of painting ears we're going to start um, uh, well we're just going to sort of like move away um, from the ears and then focus on full figure or perhaps, you know, um, yeah, figure painting in a way. Um, so, and in the last couple of series, we did a portrait, then we did an ana anatomical feature. And uh, this week we wanted to sort of like um, finalize the figure based painting with a figure at the beach or by the pool. So this is an example, and we're going to try to bring examples of images of paintings that have different styles. But let's just start with what with what we think was the beginning of uh, everything. This is a painting by Eugene Baudin, and he was a painter who is not that well known, um, who actually taught a lot of the Impressionists um, that it was okay to go paint outside. So, um, yeah, the Norton Simon Museum here in Los Angeles, um, or Pasadena rather, uh, which is going to open its doors, hopefully, I think, in a few weeks, um, they actually have a nice collection of Baudins. And Baudin was a painter who, uh, a French painter um, from mid to late 19th uh, century, who... Um, um, and uh, just painted outside and uh, you could see that the formats of the paintings were very small we are completely infatuated and mesmerized and in absolute love with his work um, and yeah they're very petite landscapes and you can tell that these were not um, obviously photographic because there's a lot of uh, dynamic energy in those uh, paintings tiny paintings but bathers and groups of bathers ended up in his portraits um, and his paintings a lot. So he uh, preceded the Impressionists in painting uh, people by the beach. And in fact, at the time, uh, this was a time when uh, people actually reinvented what it meant to go to the beach. Because before the 19th century or before mid 19th century, the beach uh, was seen as a place of uh, uh, not a, not a very friendly uh, place. It was a place of where you would get food. <laughs> it was a place where ships would either depart or arrive. Um, it was a place where uh, bandits and thieves and people of ba with bad intentions were sort of like lurking and getting ready to just do uh, bad things. So um, 
there was a, a specific moment d during the 19th century in which these uh, completely changed. And this is our modern um, uh, take of going to the beach. It started um, in many places in Europe. Um, there's, there's a history of uh, uh, going to the beach, uh, but mostly it was the UK, um, the country that essentially started uh, modern tourism, if you will. There was this idea uh, because of the Industrial Revolution, uh, people had more mobility and also um, a lot of the upper classes, um, they just felt uh, that they didn't have the same uh, strength and health um, as anyone else. So they uh, decided or they discovered that uh, going to the beach would give them a lot of benefits and would help them to sort of like cure a lot of their afflicting um, uh, conditions and um, it, yeah, health uh, status. So it was at that time um, that the beach uh, uh, took a different take. People saw the beach as a place of going to get healthy. Uh, it was a place of going to relax. And all of a sudden, that idea of the beach uh, being uh, or, or going to the sea uh, being something threatening and something that people really didn't want to um, do, it completely flipped. Uh, in addition to that, uh, writers and painters especially, they started uh, also romanticizing um, this space, uh, this natural space that had su such terrible connotations before. So painters like Boudin contributed to the idea of going to the beach, beach being something uh, posh and luxurious and, um, you know, uh, uh, giving you status. Um, so yeah, that there is a specific point in recent uh, uh, history in which the beach turned to a place that was scary to a place that was actually uh, like a playground. So um, yeah, a lot of the representations of water and ocean stuff and beach and sand before the mid uh, 19th century were based on uh, uh, the, imagining the, the the place being um, uh, the beach being a place of wars, for example, invasions um, of uh, natural disasters, of uh, biblical 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 um, uh, the stories of uh, death and floods and places that you didn't want to live there. Um, uh, mythology also. Uh, taught people that uh, the beach or the ocean was the place where dangers, like terrible dangers, um, uh, awaited. So monsters, um, shipwrecks, and uh, mythological creatures that lived um, in the water were always ready to sort of like do something really terrible. So it's very interesting. It's very interesting to see that switch from... Uh, the collective of what a, uh, being by the ocean looked like and what it means today. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to show you a couple more examples of um, uh, bathers. And again, we're just going to um, curate, we curated a selection that's based on a different uh, take. Because uh, as we said earlier, a lot of painters took the opportunity <laughs> to have, to going to the beach, um, of going to the beach to paint like naked ladies. So this is a, a Cezanne, um, uh, painted in 1887, um, end of the 19th century. It's titled Bather. And Cezanne, we, I mean, we, when we think of Cezanne, what, uh, we think of two main subjects, uh, still lives, especially with apples and, um, peaches and things that are orange looking. And also, um, uh, landscapes with lots of pine trees. But there is a large body of work that he did of bathers, um, single bathers and also um, groups of people by the beach. And we love this image because it, it, I mean, obviously this is not a David Park because there is a complete disconnect stylistically from um, both um, pieces. But there's something really reminiscent, I would say, of a, um, a neo-expressionism, if you will. Um, we love the posture and please take notes of uh, ideas for um, uh, 
positions, postures, um, expressive movements of the body, because this will be mostly a figure uh, painting exercise. So uh, yeah, the hands on the hip, uh, the treatment of uh, the body, it's not perfectly, or it's not done in a very literal way. There is some sort of like um, odd uh, distortion. Uh, this is a good example of featuring the actual black line uh, that he used a lot in his paintings. Uh, the expression of the face. Um, there is, I don't know if you can see, but the water uh, on this scene, it's like right under his feet. And what we love the most about the painting is the fact that the figure looks like a giant because the landscape is very low and um, there is no cast shadow on the feet. It's, it, it's really strange. Um, Cezanne, you know, did a lot of like experiments uh, before he just moved into more of a cubist style. So this feels extremely odd from a painter's point of view. And we love that. This it, it, It's more like a giant because of the landscape and also the uh, inexistent uh, cast shadows at the bottom of the feet. It's so weird. But if you want weird and uh, by Suzanne, we're just going to give you a painting that is gorgeous and weird uh, combined. So obviously, this is also... Um, um, Cezanne painting and this was painted in uh, 1877 before the first one that we showed it's also titled Bather um, and this combines um, the his love for foliage and green and landscape and style we love this painting for many reasons obviously so on this painting you don't see any horizon line um, there's no sky and there's no water so everything is filled in the background or behind the painting all the way to the top. Um, you can only see sort of like a tiny piece of land at the bottom, but he's not really uh, standing on it. He's standing on the edge of that land. So there is a really weird optical illusion. But the most interesting part and what makes this uh, very contemporary, almost neo-expressionist, is the fact that the proportions are totally weird. So. First of all, you see these legs that are so uh, scrawny and kind of like rachitic and uh, not proportionate to the length of the body. He just kind of like squeezed them inside of the format. But they're so minuscule. They're just kind of like tiny. Like um, the body kind of like starts with the face and the hands. And that has an, a really nice line of beauty. If you notice the axis of the head and then the axis of the torso and then uh, the belly does another axis and then the butt does another uh, round. So there's a lot of like serpentine uh, movement that it's glorious. But the length of the torso compared to the rachitic legs, the scrawny legs, it's hilarious. So it's a beautiful painting, but at the same time, it's really <laughs> weird. But it serves as a good example that stylistically... We don't have to worry too much about anything uh, that has to be perfect. And uh, we think of Paul Cezanne as like being the epitome of like whatever. But this is, I mean, in, in regards of like figure painting, it's a terrible example. But in regards of like freedom and um, not worrying about proportions, it's an awesome example. So this is a good example um, of the subject for this week, bathers. Uh, so we're just going to move forward in time. And of course, uh, we just checked uh, Berthe Morisot, the French um, uh, Impressionist painters. We forgot about the rest of the dudes. And uh, we brought Berthe Morisot because we love her work. We love her use of greens. This was painted in 1891. So we're moving forward in time uh, compared to the last season. And I'm going to try to just keep it under 30 minutes. It's also titled Bather. It's a female figure. We don't know much about this um, uh, uh, figure, but we will uh, do some research tomorrow about who this person may have been. Um, this is a beautiful example of a Morisot painting with her typical use of blues and greens. We are fascinated by how she um, translated uh, foliage the transparency and the ethereal quality of the layers of paint right here it's so exquisite um 
there is something really innocent and vulnerable and different um, with the position of the figure. And you can, if you scratch under the surface, you could just see the difference between a male gaze and a female gaze. Um, there are a bunch of, uh, as I say, naked ladies um, in paintings that, you know, they were done just for the excitement of a certain group of people. But with this painting, there's something different. There's something intimate. There's something that feels respectful. There's something that integrates the figure with the landscape. Because there were, there's, with the male gaze, there's always an attention to the figure. But uh, the water, the the animals, um, uh, the position of uh, the figure, the extension of the hand touching the water, there's an action being played right there. There's contemplation, there's meditation, uh, but there's also an intent of integrate the figure in the water where you don't see this in the male gaze. It's just the exploitation of the physicality of the female figure. This is something we're going to talk about, and this is one of the uh, reasons why we chose um, also this painting as part of an example. And from the painter's point of view, yes, there is a little bit more um, well integration. It's funny because Bernard Rousseau didn't make the books, the history books, um, but you put together uh, the Cezanne before and Bernard Rousseau, and the Cezanne has nothing. I mean, literally, it has nothing uh, compared to this. But yet, uh, Paul Cezanne is what we know of. Berthe Morisot, you know, one of the three dames, whatever that expression is, because some people feel like it's a little bit insulting. The three grand dames of Impressionism. Why not uh, one of the big Impressionist painters of the time? Um, anyhow, moving forward, another Bather image. Um, uh, Gustave K. Bott, we love his work. He, for a different reason, he was also swept under um, the, the, the rug of art history. Um, this is, stylistically, it's not a painting that we, we want to use as an example, but uh, K. Bott uh, was interesting in the sense that uh, he wanted to paint moder modernity and contemporary times. So there is something about his paintings that tries to capture something in motion. Um, so uh, his most famous uh, painting was um, the uh, scene with the uh, people crossing the street under the rain with the umbrellas uh, in a street in Paris, which which you can see the new Paris built. Paris built, I know. Yes, and then also um, people that are walking. So there is something about Gustave Cabot that uh, is all is all about like capturing a. Uh, something in motion. So this is titled The Bather or The Diver. And uh, um, so, yeah, this is an, uh, an exquisite. Maybe the reason why he didn't make the history books is because stylistically there was nothing really revolutionary. But there, there, was, there were other things that were, they were revolutionary. This is a revolutionary composition, if you ask us. There is a figure that is com like split in half on the edge um, that's barely showing... Uh, and then there's the diver that's getting ready to uh, just dive in the water. So it's a really fun, fully clothed. So it's a different position. It's not about um, posing. So this is a good example or an example of perhaps giving you um, the opportunity of choosing an image of a bather about to do something, about to jump in the water or playing uh, or catching a ball. It's not just about... Um, um, modeling or yeah, uh, sitting. Uh, we're just going to move forward to another example, uh, maybe moving forward in uh, history. We don't have that many. Um, thankfully, many more. So let's just go to this amazing painting. And this is by uh, an artist from the UK. Uh, his name was John Duncan Ferguson. Uh, 1874 to 1961. Uh, this is called Bather's Evening. And um, yeah, we just uh, love the style of the painting. Uh, obviously, the grouping, something very interesting about the dynamic between the figures. Three figures um, looking at the ocean, one figure walking towards us, 
uh, of the three figures, um, uh, one of them is uh, reclining or sort of like laying or sitting on the towel. Uh, we love the visual planes on the back, the idea of landscape as well, the rock formations um, on the coast. So you can focus or, or you can uh, 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 take a hint of where this was painted. But at the same time, we love uh, the skin color, um, uh, the contrast of the skin color against um, this predictable landscape. There are boats as well. It's a very interesting image. John Duncan Ferguson. Um, so a different example, more um, concentrated on a grouping of figures rather than one. So just um, when you, we're going to have like a, a series of uh, photographs. We're going to work off of a photograph um, and they, they will be mostly focused on single figures just because we want to make our lives easier but if you think you want to incorporate more figures this could be a good way of getting inspiration on how to represent them uh on our paintings so and i think finally there is something oh no there's this amazing talk about grouping and style and a different um a kind of like take oh i yes so this is by a painter also from the uk samuel Samuel John People. People? People, yeah. I think so. Samuel, Samuel John People, 1871, 1935. We have to find the date of this painting because this is sort of like uh, essentially turn of the century and we've never heard of this painter. Uh, and this style feels extremely contemporary. Look at the way the figures have been... Um, um, painted really they're not fully formed there's um, something really beautiful about um, the edge quality um, this is we, we could argue that this feels very neo expression is also very David Parkish <laughs> um, so notice uh, the figure right on uh, the left uh, it's just formed by a one brush stroke uh, it's one brush stroke and that's it. There's nothing inside. There are no eyes. There's no the waist. There is nothing. And then the figure right next to it with the red hat. Uh, it's formed also by the line. But then there's the flesh tone, but barely painted. And this reminds us of what we talked about this week, this past week, about uh, when we painted the ears. The difference between visual effect and visual illusion. And how one visual effect is more focused on what the paint does on the surface and visually uh, illusion it's more focused on what the painting looks like when you take a step back and see um uh, what the brush strokes kind of like form in our minds so perfect example here of a uh, visual effect and visual illusion and the visual effect being just like a, a bunch of brush strokes that are completely disengaged, disconnected, and then uh, the visual illusion of people actually caught in the act of doing something. Talk about K-Bot. Uh, one figure squatting, the other one uh, walking. There is this figure right below that's going to put like um, a, a something, a shirt or... A... Okay, 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 we're back. There was a little pause. But yeah, uh, so different... Th there's a scene where different things um, happening at the same time compared to the group uh, image before. Uh, in which the figures were more static. There's um, a lot of things going on here. So it's a very dynamic and active, um, caught in the moment uh, piece. And it doesn't feel extremely male gaze uh, per se, although, um, you know, the, 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 it was a guy who painted this, maybe in the selection or the rendition of the figures that are naked, which have, which are female. So perhaps there is a component here of voyeurizing, objectification, for sure. But the more we think about it, the more, yes, we can agree with that. But at the same time, it's just the fact that uh, stylistically, this is a beautiful image. So I'm going to rush because uh, I we would be talking about this like for the long, for a very long time. This We're very excited about this subject. Um, so, and things about, uh, that we wanted to say about contemporary, um, uh, history about uh, going to the beach um, and it's the fact that uh, w uh, there are so many things today after the 15 months uh, of isolation that are gonna change uh, I feel 
we feel like people may not return back to the beach like immediately. Um, we feel like the beach um, for this period of time uh, has been seen as something that um, has been uh, dangerous uh, to go to because of, of the potential aspect of ca catching the virus. So I just feel like uh, there's gonna uh, there, there's been a little bit of a reset button in regards of like how we see the beach today. This is not like 2019. Uh, are people going? Uh, in addition to that, I feel like in the past few years also there's been even more uh, focus on the damage of sun exposure. So people are more afraid of getting um, exposed to the sun and getting uh, uh, DNA damage and aging. So uh, we're just kind of like asking questions. Is it going to be also an added factor about people not going to the beach anymore uh, because of that? So the co the health component of the mid uh, 19th century, maybe on the 20th, uh, 21st century, it's more like a danger than uh, anything else. Um, and we're just going to also open a couple of cans of worms. Uh, people are having a lot of uh, also um, body uh, the, the issues. I don't like to use the word issues, but there's a lot of body dys uh, dysmorphia. There's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of fear about being judged about what you look like. And I feel like social media hasn't helped in uh, in maybe the intention of instilling bo body positivity um, uh, was an, was that an intention. But we've been reading um, the dramatic uh, increase of uh, eating disorders, for example. Uh, people are completely shocked at how is it possible that uh, during these 15 months, uh, there's a, a monumental increase um, body image issues, uh, dysmorphia, it's a term that happens or that we hear a lot. And it's kind of like specifically body dysmorphia. Perhaps we could just narrow it down to a very specific um, um, group, I would say, uh, people that are transitioning um, uh, or in between genders. But I feel like, you know, there's something that perhaps it's affecting more than more people than we want to believe. So our point and the can of worms that we want to open up is that um, and also the idea of having a beach body. I mean, no one, uh, you know, no one had the time <laughs> to even contemplate what that actually means. But this kind of like added pressure of looking a certain way before you actually go to the beach or the pool. We wonder how much the 15 months that we have been reflecting on things and how the world had to, has changed around us, how much of that is going to factor in factor in in our decision of perhaps not going to the beach and then sort of like exposing ourselves uh, or our body uh, to others. So that's another thing that, uh, yeah, we want we wanted to mention. And also, um, yeah, the water is uh, uh, polluted. There are more plastics on the water. There's more trash on the uh, sand, although uh, beaches that are uh, taken care of, um, they, you know, they comb the sand. But, you know, there's still a lot of trash. So there's this idea of going to the beach and finding hazardous materials at the beach, on the sand and also in the water. So that's another factor that perhaps we all are reconsidering. And also, finally, uh, the fact that, you know, we uh, have... Uh, adjusted ourselves to spending massive, massive, massive amounts of hours uh, just like consuming digital content. So we are perfectly content just like like scrolling on our um, phones. And the idea of going to the beach means, you know, prepping for it, spending money, uh, driving, parking. Is that something that affects uh, or, or is going to affect our decision? Since we feel like we have been perfectly okay just entertaining ourselves with these little stupid devices, what's going to happen um, uh, when we actually physically have to take our butt, our butts from point A to point B? Uh, is it going to be something that's going to be a nuisance? Um, so all these things make it even more interesting for us to do a subject in our paintings that really symbolizes the romantic idea of summer. So it's something that we want to bring back, the idea of call us uh, romanticizers of uh, the beach or the pool. Oh, by the way, there is I have one contemporary image uh, or, or one image of a contemporary painter. And this is a very recent 2019 before the world just... Um, was set on fire. Um, and this is a contemporary artist. Her name is 
uh, Claire Menk. Uh, she's from South Africa. Uh, this was painted in 2019. Bather couple on a lot on a lawn so yeah we forgot about this image but um so we stated all the negatives um in the sense that we question and reflect if this memorial day weekend um people are actually going to go to the beach or not it would be very interesting uh to find out but also we wanted to bring some studies from before uh 2020 about why people are living at the beach or near the beach are happier they're calmer um, they are um, they appreciate the smaller things in life better uh, they are less stressed um, so in a study published in the journal of coastal zone management participants who live in homes with ocean views I mean of course I mean that's ridiculous to today's standards report feeling calmer than those without them so maybe there's another um, aspect of the history of being by the beach, that's going to be um, based on the halves and half half knots. Because I mean, talking about someone who lives by the beach with ocean view, <laughs> if they don't feel calmer, they should go check themselves <laughs> in um, somewhere to examine their brains. Because uh, the the uh, view of the ocean, by the way, uh, calms uh, or affects our um, brain waves. The sound of the water. Um, also um, affects our immune system. Uh, Hawaii, uh, apparently it's a state that ranks the happiest in the entire U.S. Um, so I, I, I don't know if that, um, I, I'm not sure what kind of like par par parameters, but um, that's also very interesting. The color blue has been found by an overwhelming amount of people to be associated with feelings of calm and peace. Uh, staring at the ocean actually changes our brain waves frequency and um, of, of our waves frequency. Sorry, I'm just reading a study published in the American Association for the Advancement of Science Journal even found that blue is associated with a boost of creativity. So perhaps the U Eugene Boudin um, uh, painters or the post Eugene Boudin, maybe they just felt like they painted better if they were at the beach surrounded by so much blue. So that's an interesting study that we wanted to bring not to make this not just so negative because there is a very important article in the Smithsonian that talks about the history of the beach uh, as we see it today. And it, 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 it talks about the environmental effects of actually seeing the beach as a place that it's not really affected by natural disasters or climate change. Um, there is, uh, let me just find uh, the data. And I'm sorry, this is very long, but, you know, I think it's very interesting. So 70, 75 to 90 percent of the world's natural sand beaches are disappearing due partly to rising sea levels and increased storm action, but also to massive erosion caused by the human development of shores. So there you go. Um, the scientists or the people who did the study describe seaside rituals that have more to do with ecological disaster than leisure. Governments importing sand from overseas to satisfy tourist expectations and dump trucks filling the barren stretches of the U.S. eastern seaboard. Today, fully one half of the world's people live within 60 kilometers, 37 miles of an ocean. Coastal populations have increased 30% in the last 30 years, and the figure the figures are expected to soar in the next decade. Beachside properties are among the most valuable in the world. And while coasts have become the most desirable places to live, they are also highly vulnerable habitats. So perhaps we shouldn't go to the beach for other reasons, not just because of sun exposure, pollution, plastics, microplastics, garbage on the sand, and what else? I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't go to the beach because by going to the beach, we are contributing to this ecological disaster. You know, in a few years, uh, by the way, these articles in uh, this article in the Smithsonian, which we will kind of like explore tomorrow as well, uh, ends up with the idea that maybe in the future uh, there, there will be no more uh, history of the beach because there will be no more beach, uh, essentially. That's the end. 
Um, anyhow. So join us tomorrow. And by the way, something very interesting that we wanted to say, we have like still some people in the audience. Yeah, we love you so much because that means that we're saying something that may be worth for you to stay. So stay one more minute because one of the main reasons why we're doing this as well, it's because next Saturday we are hosting our next um, outdoor, uh, outdoor painting session at Bruce's Beach. Bruce's Beach is a plot of land in the middle, smacked in the middle of Manhattan Beach that recently, uh, uh, actually, as recently as a few months ago, the land was seized from uh, an African-American family that purchased legally the land and became a destination for people living in the South, um, in South, uh, South LA to go to the beach. But some people in Manhattan Beach at the time, uh, among them uh, members of the uh, Ku Klux Klan, <laughs> they didn't like that. So the city got involved and they actually um, uh, seized the land. They uh, uh, Before they seized the land, they harassed the family nonstop, burn, burning stuff. I mean, it's a really dark history. But... Um, very recently, as recent as few months ago, uh, the same city, not the same people in the city council, but the city council decided to just give the land back to the descendants of the family. Uh, we are very excited to go there because there is a, an obstructed view of the ocean and there are still some uh, remnants of racist history. It would be a great opportunity to actually discover the place understand the history and the significance of what happened because i think if i'm not mistaken this is the first time in uh the country that uh, land that was seized was restored back to the original owners or the descendants of the original owners owners bruce's beach a different take on bathers beach culture beach um uh history recent history um, so let's just do this tomorrow as a, a preamble, uh, prologue, I guess. So that's a better word. I don't know if that the one before it exists. Uh, going to Bruce's Beach, uh, Saturday, June 5th. We're going to be there. Bruce's Beach. We're going to paint whatever's around us. There just, there's grass. There are a couple of trees. It's the, the, and then there's the view of the ocean. So, But it would be interesting to do something like that. So thank you. This was possibly the longest uh, uh, Ruthless Dark and Pony show, um, but thank you so much. Uh, please, please, please register tomorrow. The paintings that are coming out of our workshops are amazing. And um, start finding uh, childhood photographs because uh, I think that could be of yourself or of uh, someone um, around you. Uh, if you can find them, that would be interesting. Uh, just. So so we can immortalize those uh, memories because who knows what the future holds in regards of like going to the beach it just seems like it's going to completely and radically change and if not we're just going to compile a bunch of like images or curate images of people at the beach and then we can use that as well um we haven't done any shopping for swimsuits we have no idea uh we feel like our social media is being bombarded with stuff I don't know, it's because we thought about doing this and there is something evil in um, social media. The social media overlords can read our minds, but all of a sudden our um, social media uh, platforms have been flooded with um, beach stuff, beach going stuff. So who knows? Bye. <laughs>